Tales from Beyond the Pale. It was something we wanted to do because it took us out of our comfort zone. And it was a nice experiment for us to sort of let go of the visual and just concentrate on the audio. All the Glass Eye Picks movies, we've always celebrated sound and sound design and really put an emphasis on that, especially some of our slow burn films as they're known. So it was fun to translate that, just turn the picture off altogether and continue to push the envelope. Some years ago, it seems now, Glenn and I were driving upstate. Uh, we were going to see uh, Jim Mickle shooting Stakeland, so whenever that was. And uh, I had recently started playing radio plays for my uh, kid, who was, I don't know, 10 or something at the time, and we would listen to um, old time, Boris Karloff, Alfred Hitchcock, all kinds of fun radio stuff uh, on the drive up. And Glenn and I were listening and... And we kind of just looked at each other and talked, God, you know, wouldn't it be amazing to circumnavigate all the bullshit that you have to get through to make a movie and just go straight to the content. And I think the one thing I'll say positive about Glass Eye Picks is that we never let any ideas go. Uh, most people would have said that and that would have been the end of it. But uh, it got stuck in my craw and um, I went to Glenn and I said, let's, maybe let's do it, what would it take? And of course he had been uh, on the road with I Sell the Dead. And got to meet uh, Paul Solit, so it was nice to reach out to Paul and see if he had any projects or any treatments or outlines that he just couldn't get made, get into a movie and it, would he like to turn it into uh, an audio drama. So we gave a call to a lot of different uh, filmmakers, um, and we said, do you have any scripts that are lying in a drawer that might lend themselves to an audio treatment? And it was really fun, the response, and uh, um, we started putting together this 10-episode series. And that was uh, season one, which, of course, we did those in the studio. And some of them, uh, Simon Rumley, a uh, great filmmaker, made his in England. So all we did is insert the host. And uh, a couple of them were produced in L.A. So it was really fun. We'd get them in the mail. It's sort of the way we present them as if they're arriving in the mail to the uh, Tales headquarters. And uh, indeed, that's how it came to us. And then we'd put the host in. We sort of started to figure out how the host would play and what his character was. and. It was a great collaboration. Now, of course, a couple of years later, we decided to do it again, but this time live. Uh, well, I've been fortunate enough to host a series, like an interview talk show series for Dixon Place called Fear Mongers, uh, fireside chats about horror films. And it's really just an opportunity for, for me and some friends to geek out about horror movies. First, I had Larry Fezenden on as a guest, and I got to do a little Jay Leno interview with him, which was amazing. Uh, and then that led to doing an interview at a future Fear Mongers with Glenn McQuaid. I can't even remember how the conversation got started, but you know, Tales from Beyond the Pale had been something that they had worked on already, and we had discussed it on stage. But there was always that like, ah, oh, well, wouldn't it wouldn't it be great if we did a Tales from Beyond the Pale live, like a prairie home companion for the the slasher set? Rehearsals were fun. We didn't have a lot of time for them. And we were, we were really lucky if we had the entire cast of any one tale at any one time. So with each tale, we would, um, we would read it on a Thursday night, uh, and that would get everybody oriented. Um, the roles would be divvied out, and, uh, 
and we just get a sense of the style and the pacing. And that was a time for often the musicians were present and able to start to conceive of what they were going to do. And certainly John and Sean were there and uh, taking vigorous notes about the kinds of sounds they would need. To whatever to go. Oh, well, that's that's that to me uh, sounds like. Nice. <laughs> to me, the idea is they point out that it was a year ago. It doesn't feel that way. Well, you know, oh, talking, yeah. Stan you were there for me, six you know. days of unrelenting terror. That's right. Whereas it's been a year. You could be right in front of them and, 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 and not see a thing. When you turn your head, that's that's when they move. After they took me, there was there was nothing. Only darkness for a long time. the challenges that we've had doing a radio show is that there's not a lot of experience that people have doing radio. So obviously um, it's new to everyone. It feels fresh to everyone. I mean, it's very exciting, uh, but there's very specific technical challenges. When you're doing a live radio show, you're speaking to your, you're playing to your microphone and it's an actor's instinct to connect to the actors on stage that are next to them. And we're trying to get people to connect to their microphone to connect to uh, the, their own thoughts, their own images of what's going on, but to not follow that instinct to try to connect to the people around you. So keeping people focused, straightforward, and playing straight out and not turning and, and engaging one another is almost, again, it's just like the, the writing challenge. It goes against everything you've learned. It goes against all your instincts. So you have to unlearn and then re-experience the, the process through a different lens which is fun. Radio uh, versus film or uh, live performance, they're wildly different mediums. Um, they, they, uh, uh, a, a lot of actors are trained. I was, you're, you work off the other actor and, and it, it all kind of feeds into your performance. And uh, in, in radio, the relationship, the key relationship is more you and the microphone and you gotta kind of put your energy, obviously you do it, you're, you're putting it all into the voice and you're hopefully sending it out through the microphone, but you're not necessarily working off the other actors the way that you would uh, in a film. A book has yet to be written, and you wish to be its author. Am I right? I can't say, actually. There's so much I, I, I don't understand. It seems my survival is dependent on, it seems my survival depends on me paying very close attention to what works, and then merely repeating these steps. May I speak frankly? I should say so. No, I, well, so, so. I should say so. In fact, I demand. So let's take it from, is it, uh, is it true, young lassie? If English bitch kill dog, I sell her to sex traffickers. I find her, all her friends and cut them up for spare parts. Debbie does dogs? Tell me that's not an animal porn site, Rob. Uh, if I did, I'd be lying. Oh, you guys think you're respectful to Sarah? I look at that sad face, though, eh? Dad is waiting, Spat. Right, it can wait longer while I go over things with Sarah. Sarah has been told. This is, uh, well, it don't really matter what his name is, does it? Uh, this is Dymo. Mm -hmm. None of that, lad. I <laughs> know. Ah, Be nice to the lady. <laughs> <laughs> She's bringing you to a new home. <laughs> ah, here. <laughs> He never stopped dreaming up new ways of getting our land back. I watched him chase those dreams face down into a ditch. What's the matter? Do, uh, but do we have to dig them up? <laughs> no, no, we mustn't disturb them. We just need some clippings to clone. Everything else gets ripped up, though. John. You said just a note there for John. Yeah. I think uh, John is very much a ghost of him, of his former self. Sure, so I sure. slow him right down sure. as well. Sure, sure, sure. Is he a ghost or is he a person? No, he's a person. Okay. He's just half the man. Just show him. Okay, know, okay, okay. Yeah. That makes sense. No, 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 no! Tell me, please! Grab her by the ankles! <laughs> the ankles? <laughs> <laughs> 
This far, so I'm gonna just. Gay? No, well, not lately. Well, I'm just saying, is this like a gay issue? I no, it's not. No, it's just no, an no, idea no, I don't like. So I, don't I, I, I didn't write it like, like that, it. and I respect I James's process. From he's found a character himself, and and for me, the goal of getting everybody here is that everybody brings their own kind of. The only reason I suggested it. it seriously, the only reason I suggested right. it was that there's a certain taste and class. Thank you. Gay people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's fair why, enough. It's all that's good. Why it's I'm just suggesting it. It's, it's not a put down. It's, it's, it's all good. It's just out. I just feel like we spent like a more. I mean, I, it's just not but a. I want to say that. I mean, just speaking about the story, it's yeah. not about unwillingness to. Uh, we can read it as vaudeville, but the point is, is that what I think is fun about the story is that she goes through one guy after another. And that she is using her wily, incredibly feral, feminine sexuality to bring these guys in. They all have different timbres, uh, you know, the first guy and then Tommy. They all have different qualities. But uh, it, uh, I think it's fair to say that it is a... She's on a heterosexual journey. I don't know. I mean... Well... Yeah. I think it would be fun. I just thought that would be a fun suggestion. That's all. Yeah. Um, no, it's interesting. As a writer, I've always... I've found it difficult to write gay characters for such a long time. I'm starting to push myself to do that lately. But you're you gay, know? right? Yeah, I am. Okay, I'm so I think that's what's interesting here. So I guess there's a great range of ways that you can interpret totally. this. Totally. Yeah. And to, totally. so to your point, not to keep going over old territory, but... If Alan was doing, he'd have probably a great take on it, but but that's not how I see it. And so, since I feel like I have so many moves and so much time to do them, and I don't want to yeah. spend time doing with a French accent or a Vietnamese accent or somebody who's effeminate or not effeminate or really, I kind of have a thing we're going to feel pretty good with, and yeah. I just want to hit the ground because we have a limited amount of time and a little amount of space to do it in. Your land, it's fruit. It's utterly subpar. I can't see how I can be any help to you. It's admirable that anything is growing here at all, but these fruit, they're more suitable for, for... Vinegar? I was going to say raisins, but yes, you get the point. Just some childish crush you got going on. You'd like me to call you an ambulance? <laughs> well, you're a fucking ambulance. <laughs> I folded and pushed the rest of John into the blades. Then, red from head to toe, I cleaned up, showered, and prepared for bed where I slept peacefully until something woke me in the middle of the night. Go on with you. Get back to your grave, you, you don't belong up here. Just then, the crow on Tommy's shoulder pecked and plucked out an eye from his blackened face. It didn't swallow it, just kept it there in its beak so both eyes kept on staring at me. I said, Your Holiness, I understand little of the why and what for. But what really impresses me is the fire. 
How did you know to heat the milk solution? I would often become ill when I ate the cheese and, and I discovered quite by accident that if I heated the mixture, I didn't get sick. Calves to face, constable. Calves to face. And use green wood. But your holiness, I want him to burn slowly. Please. Yes. Yes. That's it. Breathe. 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 Daddy. That's, that's right, Jonathan. It's, it's me. Now, come, come to Papa. Everybody, on the count of three, let's all sing to the birthday boy. One, two, three. Happy birthday, son. How amazing is this place, you guys? Miles from the city, no cars, no people, just shooting stars over our heads. Uh, I, I, I was uh, fishing up in the mountains. My brother was supposed to come. His name is Stan. Exaggerated. <laughs> to what extent? Uh, totally. The annotations, that language, it's backwards. Mirror writing. You might show your respect ah. to Sarah. Oh, look at that sad face, though, eh? Car is waiting, Sparky. It can wait longer while I go over things with Sarah. Well, that doesn't sound healthy. <coughs> I recommend you give up smoking, old thing. Desperate dogs, what about that one? Promising. Oh, look, a really crap website. That's what you need. They can't afford to be choosy. A damsel in distress. Our speciality. I need a very special dog. Uh, all dogs are special, darling. Why is that? Well, you, 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 you can't be there at night. I can't be in here at night, huh? No. Uh, listen, um, what's your name? Andrew. Andrew Nordiker. Great, Andrew. So, why can't I be in this building at night? Is this like a vampire type situation? No, no, no. I know this sounds odd, but no one should be in there after midnight. There's something wrong with that area. That part of your campus near the woods, it's sick. No one should be in there. It's good that it's been vacant all these years. Hello? Um, ma'am, are you okay? Can you hear me? If you can hear me, Stay very still. It's important. Don't move. Just stay there. Don't move at all. See, now that's scary. What, did you grow up in the 30s or something? No, no. When I was a kid, Frankenstein was on TV, and I thought he was going to walk into my room or something. I was really scared. Lame. People say that the old man died of Parkinson. But I know that it was the house itself that did him in. They say... At a novelty store, I barely cuts through this door. I right, just hold on. Just keep going. Maybe we miss Judge's face. Like what? Kinda has the weight of a small child, don't you think? When I was a kid in the early 50s, they had all these live dramas, Studio One, Philco Playhouse. You had all these great actors, John Cassavetes, Paul Newman, uh, Ben Gazzara. Uh, there were about four different shows, and they, they were performed live by these people. It wasn't videotaped or anything. And those radio shows were wonderful. I used to love listening to them. But, you know, the wonderful thing about radio is you, you have to use your imagination. It's sort of like reading in a way. Frozen to death. That's why you should listen to me when I say you can't be there right now. Uh, really? Whereas television gives you what it wants to give you. 
You don't have to do anything but eat junk food. <laughs> yeah, I miss radio. Well, I, I think with with this medium, you have to you have to establish your relationship with the microphone a little bit more. I mean, ideally, you're also playing off of the the situation of you know always, but and any other actors, you know, in terms of that rhythm that you create with them. But another important element of it, because it's, it's so, uh, you know, it's just that one sensual portal of sound. Uh, the relationship with the microphone is also, I think, a critical component. I have a big interest to, to do, to move into the voiceover work, because it seems like it would be much easier. and more fun, you know, a little easier in that you don't have to put the face gear on and all the all the stuff and, you know, all of that stuff. Because a big part of filmmaking, you know, you go into that makeup and hair process and you, <laughs> at least I feel that way, you know, you take your face and you're like, oh, okay, could someone take this? And it's, there it is, it's on your face. You can't get rid of it. Guys have it a little bit easier. You know, sometimes they don't have to go through the whole false eyelashes and all that crud, so. I think there's a real advantage to having a live audience because you're constantly reminded of the listener and you, you know, you tend not to get so lost in your, in your own thing because you're aware that you have to have an impact on somebody else. And you also get immediate feedback on whether, <laughs> whether you're getting through or not. Um, so, you know, you really, I don't know if audiences always understand how much a part of any performance they are. Um, but in the theater as well, you know, it's, it is the, the character that's absent until they show up. The difference between running it through in a rehearsal room and doing it in front of an audience, even an audience of two or three people, even a hostile audience who's like not even giving you a lot back. It makes, you know, it makes a big difference and it becomes part of the, the whole thing. Like kind of anyone uh, becomes part of your performance. Well, this is interesting what we're doing today because we're actually on a stage doing radio. So there's an audience watching. So that's interesting too. The key with that we're finding, myself and the other actors and the directors I think we're finding is that you have to do it as if it's a radio show and not, uh, uh, even though you're on stage and you're front of, in front of an audience, you're not acting for the audience. You're still doing it as a radio. So it's like the as radio. So it's like the audience is in the studio recording with you. You have to think of it like that. That's different than doing it in a studio by yourself. So it's got a different feeling. But it's um, so far so good. Our first performance is uh, well, the performance is tonight. So we'll see how it goes. I think Glenn and I both always have enjoyed the Foley process because it's so tactile and our pal Sean is in the booth at Dig It when, it's, when he's working for our uh, films, um, just being very resourceful with odd trinkets and making sounds with unexpected things. And it was fun to imagine putting that on the stage for the audience to get a little glimpse behind the curtain. <laughs> the piper for it. This was the first time for me to do a radio play, so even before the read-throughs, I had to figure out what that looked like to do fully live. <laughs> so there's not much online, actually, about that. But, you know, I I've, I've saw a couple tricks that people used back in the radio days and uh, talked with um, Beck about she was helping to develop some of these props that we would use. So like mainly the wind machine, which was a piece of fabric draped over with some wood, and you'd twist it and like, depending on the speed. On my table of props and under it, there were some that, that I used more than others. I always had a log and an axe. <laughs> for some reason, there was a lot of call for chopping sounds. Basically, so... We'd go to the read-through, and I had two different highlighter pens. One was yellow, meant I had to make a sound at this point, and the blue one meant there was going to be a sound effect that John covered. And 
I think actually I had another highlighter too that would mean the actor might cover a sound like stomping the feet or something while reading. So I just, anytime I saw a spot that I thought I might hear do some foley, I would highlight it in yellow. And then I would make a little note like what the prop would be on the side of the dialogue. And then at the bottom of the page, I would write what was coming next so I could prepare for that. And so I'd just read through as the actors were we're doing the play, and I would look at my highlights and try to keep up with what was going on. So we got the scripts for the tales piecemeal. Uh, I think we got Ram King and um, Dead Man's Shoes actually first, even though it showed up later in the timeline. Um, so uh, first got the scripts, had chances to look at it. Those were the ones I actually had a chance to really like dig in and kind of figure out what the infrastructure of how was going to play everything out. Um, I had to basically figure out a template of how all the rest of the shows were going to ha happen. So um, how many mics we needed to cover fully, how many mics we were going to need the actors, you know, scenes that had more than four actors, how we were going to decide to block them and move them around. Um, we had Larry, who was the host, and we wanted a certain sound for him. Uh, to help me, uh, I created patches in this program called Maximus P um, that essentially is like creating your own synthesizer or sample machine. And um, for each play, I created um, different levels that would be triggered, whether it be a series of ambiences that would require four different tracks, like when we're in, in Caper, when we're in the house, there's... Um, each level of the house had a different environment of sounds, of winds, of wood creakings, of uh, water drippings and all that stuff. And I would be able to ride and mix those layers um, for that environment. And then when we would move to another room, I was able to just hit a button and then those layers would fade away. Another set of layers would come in and I would be able to mix those new layers, which would be the sounds inside of the attic or whatever we were at that time. Listen with me, because wherever you think you are, maybe you're settled in your favorite chair. Maybe you're out house hunting for that perfect spot. Yes. Oh. Or you're at the seaside. Our main MO with the post-production has been to embellish and tweak but always with respect to the live performances, always to honor that and, and not to turn them into anything else. Basically, just did a first pass listen where we just hit play and just ride the volume so that it was kind of relatively listenable um, and as close as possible recreate what it was like in the live um, in theater. And then we all made our own notes about what we felt like needed to be emphasized, um, perhaps even trimmed for timing reasons, um, and started to just go in and, and, and to mix the, the pieces. Um, we did sweeten a lot of uh, the footsteps. Things are so we're sometimes, because of the feedback issues, were as closely mic'd as we wanted to, and to bring up the volume of these footsteps or certain foleys brought in the sound of an actor speaking across the room. Tabs on me. People talk. So what you hear? Uh, gentlemen, get, nice. let's focus on the task at hand. Yeah, that's fine. The joys of editing know what audio. Turner here yes. and her. Forget it. Like to say it's it's almost ten years <laughs> The joys of editing audio when there's no picture. About it. He would have done no, it already. No actor. Forget it, Gordon. <laughs> Forget what? It's used in every scene. Is that, do we use that in the like crush it. as well? Is that Tommy's grave in the crush? Yeah, it's that, that one whistling thing is like it's great. in his delivery. He can start getting a little more pithy. So two foot square. Da -da 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 -da. He's waiting here, and then we do this, and then we do that. So it'll feel like it's ramping up. Uh, Larry and I are really big fans of the artwork of horror, whether it's horror comics or movie posters or illustrations, what have you. You know, it's not, it's never really just been about the movies for us. It's it's the whole world. It's the pulp of the genre that uh, we're really passionate about. I actually went to design school and was a graphic designer for many years so it's been really cool to work with illustrators like Gary Pullen who's got a really great sense of typography as well 
I think horror typography can get really hokey really quickly and really cheap looking but Gary's got a, a real style to him and it was it was nice not only seeing our worlds illustrated by Gary and, and Ashley and Trevor and Bram but also to see the the design edge that they brought to those pieces as well uh, so as well as you know these wonderfully illustrated pieces we just have great design I think that's important to Larry and I to put our best foot forward with with, with graphics and 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 imagery and artwork it's it's a whole package for us tales from beyond the pale doesn't stop with the audio dramas it really is uh, uh, a, in its own weird way it's a visual world for us too and it's a tactile world it was really quite miraculous on the night that it all came together and um, we had a lot of surprises. In other words, performances that we had never seen would suddenly <laughs> manifest on the night. trip with glass eye i think is you know the story is is the whole thing it, it is all about the story and it's about the characters and it's and if you don't have an inv emotional investment in the characters <clears throat> the violence doesn't you know is pornographic really more than than intrinsic to the the story um and so i love i love the the whole world that's kind of is a part of of their stuff and the fact that you know they do the the audio stuff and the radio stuff and films and and all of it is is really kind of old school in the best possible way and and then Larry's just sort of a walking embodiment of all of that you know even even if you didn't say a word just looking at him you kind of get the whole thing um, so I'm really proud to be a little you know part of the stable who knew how much sin there is in Sinfandel. <laughs> Until next time, folks, this is Pheasanton signing off. <laughs>